Hey there, I'm Greg Nicotero. Hi, my name is Coleman Domingo. Hi, I'm Benai Garcia. Hi, I am Mo Collins. Hi, I'm Chad L. Coleman, Tyrese from The Walking Dead and Cuddy from The Wire. And you are listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Here are your hosts, Cynic Igri and Ryan. And you're listening to episode 109 of the Cynic Radio Podcast. And I'm your host and the master of mispronunciation, Cynic. And joining me as always, my co-host, and three people who were just about to get their Khaleesi Forever matching tattoos, Igri, Ryan, and Kim. And we are here to break down the visually stunning, game-changing, latest offering of Game of Thrones, Season 8, Episode 5, entitled The Bells. We're down to one more episode remaining of this amazing saga. So don't let King's Landing fall on your head. Make sure you smash that like button and smash that subscribe button. And if you're a YouTube addict like I am, go ahead and slap around that notification bell as well. For all the latest happenings in Westeros, every week, here on the Cynic Radio Podcast. We open the episode with Varys writing a letter about the rightful king, to whom we can only guess, and how many he's written we'll never know. We know information is power, but Cersei's proven that letters can be as useless as the people that have written them. Ryan, the Master Whispers, is a valuable ally, even if his loyalty is unstable as a third world government. But can we blame him for pumping the brakes on his love for the Dragon Queen leading into this episode? No, not at all. I think he's well within his rights. Knowing the realm and knowing the various kings and queens and kind of seeing what's going on in her mind and kind of what's festering and, and building, you know, I can understand him being a little a little scared. Can't blame him for trying to usurp her. Although I, I would say that it's, I, I guess I'm of two minds because it doesn't seem like it's in Varys' character to be so straightforward. Like it's almost like he's asking to get caught at the same time, you know, an attack is imminent. So, you know, he, it's, he, it's kind of like he needs a Hail Mary at this point. So I think at the same time as I think, you know, most of the writing is not in his character, you know, you know what, like it, it's, he, he's got very little time. The, t- the clock is ticking. He's got to do something. You know, I disagree a little bit, Ryan. I think that especially the last couple of seasons, everything he's said is that he's making his decisions based on the betterment of the realm. And he knows where things are heading right now. He knows the battle's coming. He knows she's got a dragon. He knows she's pissed. So for the betterment of the realm, holding on to the knowledge that Jon Snow is Aegon Targaryen, if he's going to die with that, that does no good to the realm. So while it might have been out of character early where he would hold information because it was beneficial to him, he's shown in the last few seasons simply by taking Tyrion elsewhere that he's really looking to try and improve the realm standing, get a fair and righteous ruler. And he thought it would be Daenerys, and now he's like, I I know what kind of people we're dealing with. So I really want to make sure that if all other options are exhausted, that somebody else knows that somebody else has a claim. Well, getting the information out there is one thing, but I think more like going up to John and being like, hey, yo, do, do you want to be king? You know, and, and kind of like openly talking to Tyrion about it. I think that's more what I mean. I think it, it, to me, it's in his character to to get the message out there and to use his, his little birds, you know, sharing the message. But to me, it just seems strange that he's so overt in, in communicating with people who have direct pipeline to Daenerys and... I just think those that didn't quite make sense. But I do agree that it, it is in his character to get the word out and, and to do it as quickly as possible. When dealing with people, I watch their behavior to others. And if they've done it to other people, they're going to do it to you. I mean, Varys really lost his power base after leaving King's Landing. He had a little bit of information coming in, but it was nowhere near the stronghold he had when he was in the capital. I just don't think it was worth the risk keeping him around. And he was outright with his treason with Tyrion. He, he, he didn't even speak in code. He's just like, well... Is there somebody better? Then we should go that way. It was really matter of fact and and kind of disrespectful and real dismissive of everything that Daenerys has kind of been through to get to the position that she's in. From Jon not keeping his mouth shut to Varys already to pre-replace her, even before she's reached King's Landing, there was a lot of talk in this episode about coin flips determining the Targaryen's disposition. But was Danny's flip swayed by the dissension in her ranks? I think she's always had it in her mind what the end goal was, what she wanted to accomplish. I think that she struggled a lot with who she could or couldn't trust. You know, like when Tyrion walks in the room in one of those opening sequences and he says, you know, I have to tell you something. And her immediate reaction was, John betrayed me. You know, she she had this 
look on her like she had just been completely and totally obliterated and defeated by everyone and everything. Everyone that she loved is dead, gone, betrayed her. And uh, I think it may have had something to do with it. But I think in the end, that determining factor was still there and she still kept to what her original game plan was. It's what, you know, her in her mind, her destiny has always been. We say goodbye to Lord Varys in one of the most interesting and well-shot scenes of the show. There was so much going on there, IG. Tyrion completely copping to it, the fact that it was him. Goodbye, old friend. Varys taking it like a man and saying, hey, I hope I was wrong. And the dragon coming in on cue. I I wonder if they practiced that because it was perfectly orchestrated. But also the sadness of Danny left talking in the third person, all those titles and no hype men. And John's reaction afterwards, seeing him do the math in his head. I mean, hey... When you get in an argument with Daenerys, she doesn't throw a shoe at you to win the argument. It's just straight to the dragon fire. Varys was warned by the Khaleesi. She's a woman of her word. And from her perspective, did he get what he deserved? From her perspective, absolutely. He said, she told him, if you betray me, I'll burn you alive. And as far as she's concerned, that's exactly what he did. And it's unfortunate because... Really, Varys is just doing what Varys does. I mean, bringing him in, you should know what you've got. And is it really beneficial to kill a person who has as many connections to knowledge and what's happening all over the world? Because he gets knowledge faster than just about anyone. Where are you going to get that now? I'm sure there are other people that have that skill, but it doesn't seem like anyone is as connected or is as good at it as Varys. And it's a huge loss. And it's also a huge loss for the show. I was hoping he was going to make it because, man, talk about a well-acted part. Talk about just a guy that stood out in just about every scene he was in. I mean, he, he had such great facial expressions. He could convey so much without saying stuff. He didn't like emote a lot. He just kind of walked around with his hands in his pockets and spoke his mind, but you could read what he was saying on his face and how honest and how much he believed it. Varys was a very complex character and I'm going to miss him. And don't forget the eunuch jokes. How about you, Kim? You're the mother of dragons. You've given up your, your unborn son, your husband, everybody that, that you've ever known and loved to get in this position. And you got this bald bastard undermining your queenship even before you land on the beaches of King's Landing. Do you think Varys deserved the dragon fire? In her eyes, yes. I I think that that was a very gruesome way to send out a good character. You know, somebody that contributed a lot to the story, like a second string player, you know. I think what was really interesting about all of that entire sequence was just how calm she was when she said Dracarys. Yeah, it it was the calmest I've ever heard her make that command. You know, you see the dragon just appear behind her. It was like it was all happening in slow motion. When you go back and you rewatch the episode, do you think this is the last time that you really see her calm? This is the last time that you see her with her shit together before she really starts to lose it, before she snaps you know, and then you see it in the another scene with John later where she kind of half comes unraveled and then at, at the end, I think it was really well done. Yeah, last week was definitely the beginning of the downward spiral for her. You could see it in her face, and it definitely carried over this week. She looked unkept, no makeup. It looks like she wasn't sleeping or eating. It was definitely the beginning of her descent. Ryan, how will you remember Varys as a character? I mean, never has a character done so little, but accomplished so much. Varys is a character from a different part of the show. And it's a discussion I think we're going to have a lot of, you know, over the next couple episodes or really the next the last one but that i really feel like this show is kind of a tale of two two shows um and you have one show that's very much tied to the books that was slower plotting more nuanced more focused on the intricacies of of this world and that was that was a part of the book or story where Varys thrived Varys and Littlefinger thrived and Tyrion and i think that once the show kind of moved past the books and they were kind of aiming for that end and that end game. It was about getting from point A to point B. And so I think where Varys was really, like Ig said, he wasn't used all that much, but he was really effective when he was. I think that he lost a lot of his effect over the last couple of seasons because he's just, it's not as nuanced anymore. And so, you know, we did get a little bit of Var- the Varys of old the last couple of episodes, but otherwise he's kind of been ineffectual. It's just kind of the, the difference of going from a TV show, you know, book to a TV show and, and, and the situation 
situation where they kind of had to tie this thing up. So I kind of feel like Varys's character was underserved over the last couple seasons, but at least we got to see him in his element a little bit. And at least he died kind of trying to protect the realm. Well, we spoke about that during the week and you've brought it up before with Tyrion. Uh, Do you feel that every character's kind of taken a few steps back since the books have been surpassed by the show? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's unfortunate because I I hate to be that kind of like, you know, comparing the show to the books all the time, but obviously it's inevitable. I I think all the characters take a step back because, and it's not necessarily the Double D's fault. You know, they didn't, you know, and again, this isn't my words, you know, I've, I've, you know, there's another podcast that I I listen to, they always say it all the time, like, they didn't sign up to write, you know, George R. R. Martin fan fiction. Um, You know, they signed up to adapt materials and um, they did a great job of that but then when it was up to them to write their own stuff I think they just lost it and, or, and kind of checked out and then they just wanted to end it so once they were less focused on ad- adaptation of material that was very nuanced and more focused on all right let's get point a point b point c they all the characters suffered and I think you know it became more spectacle and it's still a great show but it's a different show and I think for a lot of us it's kind of hard reconciling that I think I've reconciled it a little bit more than others and I think I'm less negative uh, on the show overall because I've kind of just accepted that you know it is a different show and it's not there fault necessarily. I mean, there's some things that are their fault here on, but um, other than that, it, everyone's taken a step back, but uh, you know, you, you just kind of, you roll with it, I guess. It might be HBO's fault too. Cause HBO might've been the one that said, Hey, we want to, we want to wrap this up and move on to the no. next thing. Apparently, H- I mean, uh, you know, we will never know. I guess we're not privy to these conversations. But, but from what I understand, like, I think it was really them. They were like, look, we got 73 episodes and we're done. Like, this is the, we, we have an endgame in sight. I think HBO even offered them, at least according to what what's out there now, that HBO offered them 10 episodes and they they didn't want it. They just wanted to end it. And I th- so I, th- I feel like, uh, you know, the double D's, once they realized they weren't getting any new bu- books to work with, I think they just realized, look, we're, we're done. We're checked out. We got, we got Star Wars to work on. We got whatever, like, let's wrap this thing up. I think HBO is going to push them to put something out. And I think they were kind of like, all right, well, we're done. You know, we're not going to wait for George R. R. Martin. We're not going to wait five years for another book to come out to adapt it. Let's just wrap this up. And so I think, you know, it was a, a, kind of all those forces. You got actors who don't want to be on hold for five years. And so, yeah, I think, but yeah, I don't think it was HBO pushing them because if it's HBO, who wouldn't want another, you know, five seasons of, of the, the highest rated show on TV? So I think they were, you know, I think they're as disappointed as, as some, of, some of us that, that they didn't kind of draw this out a little bit longer. Yeah, I can't imagine HBO not wanting four more weeks of incredible ratings. See, the problem is with shows that you have actors and people want to move on and do other stuff. So if we would have waited for George R. R. Martin to write these books, we would have lost actors. The show would have lost momentum. People would have stopped caring. Sopranos did that. And a couple other big name shows have taken large sums of time off and they come back and they're never truly the same. I don't blame them for the direction of the show or the shortcomings in writing. I, I was thinking about it today. It's sort of like when you start a business. The business is your passion. You build it up. You become successful. You get old and you want to hand it over to your kids. It just may not be in their wheelhouse to run the business the way you did. And that's the same thing. You're asking these guys to recreate all these characters and write dialogue and story progression for this guy who invented these characters and are actually a small parts of his personality. It's it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be as good. Kim, John goes to see Danny. And of course, I told you so's are in order. Fear is all I have now. She kisses him. And once again, he pulls limp. Could we have avoided what comes later in the episode if he would just return the love back? Yeah, if he would have just kept his trap shut, you know, and pulled a, you know, card out of Sansa's book and just kind of gone with it, knowing that there's a game plan in place. You know, if he would have just given her just a smidge of affection in return, then she probably wouldn't have lost her shit later. John is absolutely the worst person to deal with somebody in crisis because he, like Ned, he stumbles on his words. Like he doesn't seem like he always has the right thing to say. It's not in his bag where he can just reach and access it and pull it out and show it to her. She was really searching for something there and he had nothing for her. And I've dealt with people that are emotionally unstable before. And and basically you got to treat them with kid gloves and even sometimes tell them what they want to hear to kind of get them back to where you needed to get. And usually those people don't have a dragon at their disposal. So John could have really handled that situation a little better. What do you think, Ig? He was the wrong guy to send in there. Maybe you needed Varys to still be alive because he could tell her some things, make her feel good about herself. Tyrion, 
Jorah would have been the perfect person to have there. Well, but that's the pr- that's the problem with like Jorah. Part of what's going on is that, you know, she has lost Jorah and Missande, who like Missande was like her chambermaid. She could just con- consult her about everything. She would tell her the truth. Jorah would consult her and tell her things that maybe it was difficult to hear, but he had such a soft touch with her. And, you know, Jon Snow is a man of the North and they're cold men, cold hearted cold touch and they're going to tell you how it is whether you like it or not and Danny's not used to that so much anymore she's always had someone around to kind of guide her through life and it's it's going to be a rough go I don't know as, if there's anyone left in the Seven Kingdoms Essos or anywhere else that can handle her at her worst or best, honestly. Well, and that's the problem, too, is you got Tyrion, who's afraid of her. Jon doesn't know how to handle the situation. And Grey Worm, who's, oh, that's Masandi's last worldly position? In the fire. You know, everything gets to burn. What do you think, Kim? Uh, it just reminded me of, you know, the same argument that could have been made with Peter Quill and, and Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet, you know? Letting his emotions kind of uh, dictate making bad decisions or bad plays. The story could have taken a much different direction if he just would have thought about what he was going to do before he did it. Danny informs Tyrion of Jamie's hit it and quit it ways and that he's been taken prisoner. She warns him, the next time you fail me will be the last. Ryan, is there any amount of money that would get you to log on Indeed and start applying for hand jobs? <laughs> wow! Uh, yeah, it's it's it is a thankless job, especially for especially for Daenerys. Because I just feel like yeah, there's no uh, at some point you're gonna mess up and you're toast. And I think especially in this situation where I, it's interesting actually because like I you feel like Tyrion would be that one person that that you guys are talking about that that could you know, be her new Jorah or Miss Andy, but. Um, I guess you know, Tyrion is just skeptical enough, and he's not good enough at, at hiding it. That I don't. I think she doesn't think she can trust him, and he's he's screwed up count, countless times over the last couple seasons. But but yeah, it, it is a it, it's not a good position to be in, and and I I don't like his um I don't like his outlook uh, for the next episode. Yeah, I really don't either. And time after time after time, not only is he trying to treat her with scared kid gloves, but then he keeps screwing up too, IG. Has Tyrion really done a piss poor job as the hand? No, he's actually not. He's done a very good job at the hand as the hand. The problem is Daenerys doesn't listen. She doesn't listen to what he says because he's right most of the time. If she would just do what he says, listen to the council, why would you have these people in these positions if you're not going to listen to them? And time and time again, she goes, great, I'm going to do my own thing anyway. And the problem is, is then she keeps blaming him for any faults that come up, which are largely her own fault. And it's going to happen sometimes when you make your own decisions. I see managers at jobs all the time, like ask their workers, the people they put in the positions to tell them, hey, what should we do here? And you tell them and then they do something else. And then they come and yell at you when it goes wrong. And I've had that happen to me. Sure. And that's exactly what Daenerys is doing is she's yelling at Tyrion for her own shortcomings. He's made mistakes. He's done some dumb things. He's listened to his sister that he shouldn't have listened to. He's put faith in Jamie that he probably shouldn't have put. But he's done a lot of good for her and she's going to kill him anyway. I just want Theon here so I can say, what did I say about short jokes? And he was his wasn't even a good one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, show of hands, kids. You were the only one that didn't treat me like a monster. You were all I had. Tyrion and Jamie's goodbye struck an emotional chord for me. But it goes beyond the story for the people in the roles. To these people, they've been living with these other actors for nine years through a life-changing experience. Do you think, Ryan, that we're seeing a lot of real-life emotions bleed through as they all say goodbye? Yeah, I think so. And I, I you know, I, I don't know how the direction it, it would be smart. I would think of a director to kind of leverage that and take advantage of the fact that that it is, in many ways, their goodbyes and and find ways to kind of take advantage of that because there is real chemistry. And I think that being together for so long, I think they all really do genuinely like each other as people. Yeah, you know, I mean that scene was great. It, it really, really was. And I think that some of the best stuff this season. It, it just in general has been between Tyrion and Jamie. Um, it's really genuine. You really feel their relationship and, and the emotion between them. You know, you just feel the weight on Tyrion and you can feel the 
kind of Jamie just being resigned and conflicted. And, you know, it even, even that scene alone, um, I was really pissed about, about Jamie's arc kind of, and this, him going back to Cersei kind of destroying, you know, this kind of heroic arc. And I still am annoyed with it, but I'm maybe not as angry as I was largely because of their performance, because you can really see that he is conflicted, but he's resigned. He's almost resigned to the fact that he will always go back to Cersei. And I think, um, you know, you can feel that they knew it was their last time together. And I think it was a really great scene and one of my, again, one of my favorite pairings of the show. One of the standout parts of the season just has been anything where, where Jamie and Tyrion are in the same scene unless Bronn is involved. To me, yeah, it was a rough goodbye as well because I kind of identify with Tyrion, you know, maybe not for the height thing, but for more being an outcast my whole life. And when you feel that way, you only run into one or two people in your life that really make you feel normal to be around and safe to be around and Jamie was one of those people. And as far as Jamie goes, you see it with alcoholics, you see it with drug addicts, you see it with people in abusive relationships. People are just resigned to who they are. And sometimes you can't run away from that. You know, you could you could deny it. You could try to change. You could say, hey, I'm going to put down the Reese's cups and go to the gym. But at the end of the day, very few people that are stuck in really, really bad cycles can ever change the behavior. And Jamie's one of those people. He's in love with the wrong woman. He knows it. But that's who he is. You know, he's resigned to the fact that he may not like it. And he, he definitely tried to put his best foot forward. You know, he tried to pretend to be somebody else, but it just didn't work out for him. And he ended up right back in Cersei's arms. What do you think of their relationship, IG? I mean, Jamie and Cersei, a match made in heaven or what? I knew he would go back. I mean, we all see this arc. We all see this thing happening. But we've seen him do good things and end up back with Cersei anyway. I mean, he got his hand cut off defending Brienne. They go and they make him a new hand, give him a new Valyrian steel sword, and then he basically rapes his sister on top of their dead son's body. This is who we're dealing with. And people keep forgetting. They're like, oh, Jamie's such a great character now. He's such a good, he's turned completely. I'm like, just hold on, because that's not the end. We, I knew this was going to go back this way. And I'm actually kind of happy it did, because it really shows a little more complexity than we were given any credit for, especially with Jamie, because everybody's like, oh, we had this hero's journey. Look, he was bad. He was good. He was a little bad again. Then great. Like he's Deadpool or something. But he's not. He's an incestuous guy that tried to kill a 10-year-old. That's who we're dealing with. For his sister, he was going to kill her so nobody could kill Bran so nobody would find out. And now that, granted, kicked off everything that we've got now. This all happened because of that single act. And that's great. But he was going back to her. This is what we have to all realize. Everybody that's like, I'm so angry about Jamie. You shouldn't be. This is who he is. This is who he's always been. He's always been snarky and kind of a little bit of an alcoholic, and he's always been fully in love with his sister. And really, the big straw that broke the camel's back was Sansa. Sansa telling him, I wish I could be there when they execute her. That was it. He's going back. The city readies for the siege. The armies are on the field. The villagers are scurrying to safety, and Arya and the Hound and Jamie are all inside. Euron is out in the Blackwater Bay with his fleet. Ships, scorpions, the stage is set. Last week, there was a dozen ships, and it seemed like they fired a hundred stingers at the two uh, dragons. This week, Ryan, there was about 30 ships, and I saw them fire maybe about five. Was it the element of surprise swung the other way, or is my math just really, really fuzzy? I think it's a little plot armor. I didn't love... Okay, so like the scene from last week was a rough... I, I didn't love the scene, but it was epic. And how it happened, but they had three direct shots that hit, you know, hit Rhaegal. But then, you know, in that same episode, they had like they shot fifty at, at Drogon and all missed. And then in this case, yeah, they had all these ships ready lined up, and they couldn't. You know, it, it seemed a little off, um, both with the amount that they had to fire and the accuracy. But I think, you know, I guess the the, the element of surprise, that angle that the, that Drogon was coming from, and just the sheer kind of power of the we've never seen his kind of fire work that powerfully um was impressive and it almost was like shock and awe and i think you know that you were seeing like kind of a dragon fully being used as the kind of quote you know nuclear option in westeros so i think it was effective but you know i wish that last week had they hadn't been so accurate because then it's like okay well what are these scorpions super accurate or are they not like what's going on here like how do you get three direct shots but then you can't you know land one on Drogon and Drogon's kind of 
able to dodge. It was a little off, but otherwise, like it looked amazing. And like just that shot, you know, coming from, you know, from from the sky was amazing. And I, I mean, this there's a pattern. The, the entire show had some of the best shots of the show. So, I, you know, it was it was it was fine. But, you know, logic aside. Well, Kim, we went back and forth all week. What could happen? Is it going to be a sea dragon? Is it going to be baby dragons that show up? Are we going to throw armor on Drogon? What, what's going to happen? Were you slightly disappointed that it was just him simply flying around the boats? There was one theory that we had discussed, and that was that Sansa has been, you know, secretly feeding intel to Cersei. Um, and maybe that's how Euron knew exactly where to be. How else would he have known where to position himself? You know what I mean? Like somebody in that room, in the war room, when they were discussing what the strategy was, when they were making that approach to King's Landing, somebody had to inform them because they specifically like swipe their hands with those, you know, little medallions of sorts to show where they're going to come in at. This is the cove that we're going to go into because Tyrion said that there's a, a secret red keep entrance that we can go in through. And so somebody had to have fed that information to Euron so that he knew where, when and where to be in order to attack so accurately the first time. This last time was completely unobstructed. He had no idea which direction they were going to come from. I mean, you saw some of the people on the ships that were looking down into the water because they thought maybe she was going to come up from the bottom. Um, you saw him just kind of checking st- skimmishly like over both shoulders he was worried he was scared he hears that noise and she comes in through the rays of the sun where it's blinding and you know you don't have a good visual point you know to to see how and bring in the fury you know she came in with zero fucks and she was ready. IG, I guess that three dragon lead that we were joking about last week wasn't as important as we thought it was, as Daenerys single-handedly conquers the city. Which was the least effective in your eyes? The dreaded Iron Fleet or the storied Gold Company? Oh my god. You know, the problem with the Golden Company is we were hyped, you know? I mean, they, they told us about the Golden Company at the end of last season, right? They were coming in. Was then it we, the lack of elephants, you think? Eh, maybe. You know, if they'd have brought just one elephant, then maybe this whole thing would be different. They didn't bring any. But we were told, and we were shown, and here they all are, and they're all lined up on the battlefield. And they literally did nothing. You know, talk about... A CGI budget that didn't require much work because all they just did is have these guys standing there move a little bit and get burned up. Wow. The Golden Company was the most ineffective military of all time. They look good doing it, right? They they have some fancy outfits. I'll give them that. They look nice. They're dressed well. Uh, Euron was right, though, that they are not good fighters. (laughs) They did not do well. You know... they didn't do much in Blackwater Bay, but, you know, that's attributed to a dragon. And, yeah, the dragon still came out and got him in the front of the city, too. But there were still a couple alive, and then the Dothraki just ended them. So they were ineffective getting burned up. They were ineffective with the couple they had left. They weren't going to fight. Uh, sell swords, maybe they ought to be a little more selective in what they're buying. You know, buyer's remorse is definitely going to set in. Yeah, don't get your sell swords on eBay because sometimes you can't get that shit returned. Cool outfits, check. Cool emblem, check. Badass looking leader, check. Ryan, how much of a disappointment was the gold company? Pretty disappointing. Uh, again, it was one of those things like I didn't expect them to do much especially as we got towards this episode because I thought it would be more a route. But, you know, it sucks because, like, they are supposedly a formidable force in Essos. They're, you know, the most, um, you know, disciplined army. You know, they can go toe-to-toe with the Dothraki. I mean, not Dothraki, the Unsullied and the Dothraki for that matter. They were just brought in as cannon fodder. And, and I mean, yeah, it's kind of funny all the memes that, that have popped up already with with how how ineffective they were. But, yeah, to answer your earlier question, like, clearly, of course, like, the um, Iron Fleet, at, at least, like, they, they they killed a dragon. They had captured Yara and um, the Sand Snakes. So you know they they did some good, but but the Golden Company, yeah, they just kind of stood there with you know their their shiny armor. It's kind of like your first day at a new job. They give you the outfit. And they put you out in front of people, but you have no idea what the hell you're doing. So you're just standing there stiff looking around like, well, 
one thing you can say about the gold company is they do burn well. I mean, they make good kindling. Conquering King's Landing wasn't enough. Danny decided to go full Mad Queen is a much better route. And she starts to burn the entire city. IG, is this the first reported case of somebody flipping the board off the table while winning at Monopoly? She had Park Place. She had Boardwalk. She had hotels up. She even had all the utilities. And pieces go flying everywhere. Yeah, that was like, fuck you and your car and the thimble and the boat. I'm done. (laughs) You guys suck, even though I've clearly got you all beat. I can't believe that she did that, but I can at the same time. I mean, if we look every season, she's burned some people. Every single season. Season one, she burned the witch that killed Drogo, and it just went on from there. She's just been simply gaining her power through fire and blood. This is just the biggest time so far, but this is who she is. And anybody that's upset, oh my God, Daenerys, she just did all this. I can't believe she would. How She's literally told everybody that she's going to. Now, she did also say, I didn't come to be queen of the ashes. Uh, maybe she's talking about the next town over. Maybe that's where she's going to set up the new throne. But... Yeah, King's Landing is kind of done. And to flip the board when you're winning, this is like winning like 75 zip, right? She's got to be the Bears. And she's got Ditka coaching the team and everything. And she still just said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to just, I'm burning this down. I'm burning it all down, Pookie. Let's burn it all down. It's interesting because, you know, I go back and forth whether I liked the turn. Like it was clearly this has been foreshadowed for years. So I think that it doesn't, you know, I think anyone who's like shocked that that Daenerys, you know, went mad queen, you know, you, you haven't been paying attention. But, you know, I think this again goes back to the show. What what happened was. Yes, the seeds were planted, but we really didn't get enough time. You know, in a book, you can kind of from you can go from the point of view of the character. You can see what's going on in her mind, and you can really see the mental change. You can't. You don't get that in a TV show. So you need to do that. Jet ideally subtly and over the course of time, and they didn't have the time. So what we got was very you know ham fisted, smack you over the head. Oh, look, look, she's going to turn into the Mad Queen. Um, Then it becomes so obvious that you almost don't want it to happen because you're expecting it. And I think the other issue where where I think it's problematic is I wish the change happened a few episodes earlier. Like I wish we had, you know, if we had a 10 episode season, you fight the Night King episode four, she goes Mad Queen episode seven, and we got a few episodes to deal with it. But because we, you know, we have this kind of heel turn at the very end, it's really hard to reconcile because we got one episode left and now she's the villain. Um, so I think that's the issue because otherwise, like, yeah, she's going to she was going to turn and it was you know, it's going to happen. And I'm OK with it happening. I'm even OK with how it happened. And I think she's carrying I mean, her acting has been the best it's ever been and maybe the best of anybody this season. Um, and she's really carried it. But I think it's just the timing is weird. And the kind of way they hit you over the head is a little weird, even though, yeah, it has been foreshadowed. And I totally you know, expected it. Danny had a vision of this before. In her vision, she was walking through the throne room and the building was just decimated. And you see, at least at that point in time, I thought it was snow falling, you know, through the ceiling and turns out it, it was ash. And yeah, she's made that comment a thousand times. I'm not here to be the queen of ashes. Even the producers said that the they wanted to make that moment when she heard the bells. That was the moment that she needed to make it personal, that this was that that pivot for her, that she could go ahead and she could call off the shots or she could go ahead and finish that arc of hers. She she wasn't thinking about the battle. She wasn't thinking about winning or losing. She was thinking about how she had lived in exile her entire life and everything that her family had built for 300 years and that she was ready to get it over with and that this was her moment to say, you know what, I've, I've waited long enough. This shit comes to a close right now. And that's when she just kind of went after it. Well, I've seen a lot of convincing talk on the Internet. The same thing that you said, Ryan, like it's sudden, but you're a fan of wrestling as well. And some of the best heel turns of all time have been off the cuff with no 
idea that it was coming. And I think that if we would have saw that progression, I don't think it would have made the impact. Everybody would have been like, all right, here she goes. She's going to burn the city now. The fact that we weren't sure whether she was or not gave it a little more intrigue. But IG, you're right there playing the Sim City with the rest of us. Wouldn't it have been more cost efficient and life efficient to just go right for the castle rather than to burn the whole damn town? She literally dropped the mic on all of King's Landing. Yeah, she's like, you know, I don't want any of these people to come around and try and contest my taking of the throne. So I'm going to burn everything down, all of it. And it was really epic to watch and heartbreaking at the same time because why didn't she go right at that? If that's really your problem, if Cersei sitting on the throne is really your problem, go to the keep. I think she was just pissed. Like she, she was fighting this battle, destroying stuff, Went in hundred to nothing, riding Ditka through the sky. Everything is going well, but then they ring the bell and they're like, "All right, yeah, uh huh, time out. We give up." And she's like, "Like he's all fired up now, guys. Like I, he's the, the engine's running good. It's purring like a kitten. Let's go." So, I think that's what's happening. And she's like, "Uh uh-uh, uh, bitches, you wanted to do this. Let's do this. You you all that didn't want me to come and burn y'all up." should have left instead of coming inside. You had two options on where to go. You chose in instead of out. You knew what I was coming with. Y'all heard I had dragons, and instead you stayed. So now it's time to pay the piper. Oh, and that was all the go that Grey Worm needed, too. I mean, the Lannister soldiers had surrendered, and it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition because the civilians were expendable, but when the route started, the Lannister soldiers were actually trying to save the people around them, where Jon's forces, who were supposed to be the good guys, were in there just killing everything that moves. What did you think of the sequence, Ryan? I thought the sequence was great. I mean, it was it was really heartbreaking. It captured what we were supposed to get from that episode, which is this kind of switch that that all of a sudden the the heroes, you know, the heroes switch to the villains and it wasn't just Daenerys, but it kind of just shows how war changes people. And and you saw that right away with these the northern people who were supposed to be fighting for good and, and honest and good, you know. Kind of working class people, and, um, or medieval working class people, and, and uh, they changed. Even the the unsullied, who are these supposed to be these disciplined soldiers, just everybody, you know, just shows how war changes people, and and that, yeah, to see the. the Lannister soldiers then as kind of the, the good guys, like they drop their swords and they're helping people trying to survive. It was really an interesting and heartbreaking part of the episode, but then kind of does iron home that, yeah, we're, you know, the, John especially is going to have to reckon with this and he's going to have to make some tough choices in the next episode. Jamie, and you're on fight to the death in a violent no holds barred cage match where even if you win, you lose ultimately and the stupidest Lannister moves on. Kim, what did you think of the battle between the two and how will you remember Euron's character? I hated Euron's character. (laughs) I, you know, I really kind of thought that the battle was awfully well staged. I guess I want to say him coming right up out of the water and Jamie just happening to be there. You know, was he like chilling? Was he waiting for him to show up? Was this like, you know, the the one thing that he needed to complete in his life? Um, they didn't even bring up the baby. I was really hoping there'd be some sort of a brawl about that. You know, like, I impregnated your sister. The fuck you did. You know, and there was nothing about that. I thought that was a missed opportunity there. And I'm not sure how many times somebody can get stabbed in the lungs and still be able to get up and walk a couple miles all the way back to the Red Keep. That didn't make sense to me at all. The comment of, I'm going to be the one that... Uh, killed the Kingslayer, him thinking, you know, he's going off on a high note and that, you know, he's going to die happy, obviously is not the one that killed him. But I don't know. It was just kind of strange to me. It was much like the season. I felt like that entire plot line there was a little bit rushed and it could have been done a little bit differently. I really thought it was a waste of a character. I, he had the good look, fought well. I loved his quip. I loved his swagger. There was a lot about the character I liked. I'm not sure about his math, though. I, I fucked the queen, so that makes me the king. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure where he was going with that there. And yeah, I did see on the internet where Jamie got stabbed in the liver and the kidneys, but somehow he managed to function. So that was a little bit unbelievable. The pettiness of his character, like, yeah, you may have killed me, but I got you. His last words in the world is, I'm the guy that got Jamie Lannister. Like, like he needed that 
that slight ego boost just before he stepped out. IG, finally the moment we've been waiting for between Arya and the Hound as he talks her out of throwing away her life for the queen that's probably already dead or at least going to die soon. And finally, finally the little bastard thanks him. Do you think it was a fitting goodbye for two characters with so much history and based on the conditions of the city, did you think she might not make it out anyway? As much as it wasn't set up to be, that uh, scene actually kind of hit me in the feels a little bit because she called him Sander. She just, she, nobody else calls him that. They call him Hound. They call him Clegane. They call him a lot of other names, but nobody calls him Sander except she just did. And that was, to me, a really moving moment because that means they, they've connected on a wholly different level. But you're absolutely right. I'm not sure that I thought anyone, and I mean literally anyone, was going to make it out of this city alive because she was burning it up quick and things were crumbling everywhere. The Red Keep is supposed to be a very, very solid structure and it's just falling apart like it's made out of like dollar store Legos. It's not doing all that well. And so, yeah, I, I thought that even if she went out the secret tunnel in the back and went straight out to the beach and stood there and watched it all fall, she might still get hit by something falling. I'm not sure that anybody had a chance to get out. But that moment that she had with the Hound was amazing. And I'm glad that they had it. I'm glad that they included that in the show. And it, it, it says that the Double Bs don't write everything as bad as everybody's telling us that they do. She's. They really do notice things that need that moment of heart because they could have just driven by it and get out of here, girl, and she runs off. And that would have been fine. But putting that moment of heart in there shows us what kind of a great show we've had for the last nine years. Well, and Ryan, you said this today in chat. Is it just a thing now to shit on the show? The show is not nearly as bad as people are just raining feces down upon it. And the Double Ds have done an amazing job the whole run of the show up to the very end. I think that it's become kind of in vogue to to just completely shit on the show. And it, look, I get there are some situations where where they definitely deserve critique, and and we've been open to it. But I think to 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 talk about everything like it's the worst show ever is crazy. Like they've done a great job, and again, like understanding that like they did not intend on writing writing this story or finishing this story. And so I think that a big part of this, for whatever reason, people kind of got it in their heads that they have to complain about every little thing, and it's part of the fandom with whatever it is, whether it's Star Wars or or Harry Potter or whatever it is, I think fandom gets obsessed and and possessive. And if it's not exactly what they want, they freak out. And I think, you know, part of this is like, you know, I don't think anybody was ever going to be happy. I don't know what we expected or what we wanted, but, you know, we're getting a great show. And, and, and I think, yes, there are things to critique, but I think this kind of talking about it like it's the worst thing in history is, is crazy. Like there's some great stuff here. Look, it's one of my favorite shows, maybe my favorite show ever. If I just sat and, and, and wallowed in, in misery over every evil little annoying thing that, you know, it's going to suck because I'll never be able to enjoy the show again. So, yeah, I think it's a little weird that people are getting all up in arms over everything. But, you know, it is what it is, kind of the nature of the Internet and fandom, unfortunately. Kim, is it a case of memes becoming reality? And is any show or movie safe anymore? Is any show going forward going to be safe from just the overwhelming criticism that is the meme culture? Nothing is sacred when there's the Internet. You know, nothing is safe. But you also have to remember that it's, it's been a decade of people's investment of their lives and their time. And they've spent time with their family or friends and they've created bonds by watching this show. They've attached themselves to characters. They've really made this a part of their own lives. And so they, they have a certain level of investment to it. And so when something doesn't go quite the way that they were hoping it would or, you know, they see a character that maybe should have gotten an honorable death, be it gruesome or respectful, and it doesn't happen. You know, that's disappointing. It's a letdown. And so, yeah, the, the meme culture is going to be sort of the uh, the passive aggressive backlash, you know, and it's the new keyboard warrior. You know, it's no longer just internet trolls saying nasty things or rude comments on Reddit anymore. It's, you know, who can make a snarky meme that's going to draw some attention that everyone can still get on board with and maybe bring back that attachment that they're lacking. Who knows? 
Maybe it's a psychological issue. This show has never been about giving you what you want. Um, the show or the books, it's always been about, you know, punching you in the gut, just making you feel miserable sometimes. It, you know, in many ways, it's, it's tragic, a lot of what happens. What we seem to forget, and I don't care if they left the whole Starbucks franchise in the middle of the episode. The reason why the cup was such a big deal is because they've done such a good job on this show. And to miss something like that, it, of course, it's fun to poke fun at it, but it doesn't tear down the merit and everything that they've done going forward in the show as a as a show the worst episode of game of thrones is still a thousand times better than the best episode of the walking dead it's just the way it is there's nothing close to it on tv you can yell out vikings you can yell at all these other shows but facts are facts and this is probably the best show on tv right now and probably one of the top three shows that have ever been on television the whole fandom to kind of turn on them for little things like that i'll, I'll never understand ig Clegane Bowl is in full effect as the brothers finally face off, and it didn't disappoint. It was the Hound took a ride on the zombie mountain, and as a bonus, we get to see the end of that creepy-as-fuck Quiburn. After eight seasons, did the fight live up to the hype? I think the fight lived up to the hype somewhat. The part I'm disappointed in, no clear winner, right? If this is the Clegane Bowl, you know, we could have had one of them win and then the other one get crushed by a rock, but somebody needed to win. It went out in a dead heat, perfect tie, and that was disappointing. I wanted, honestly, I wanted the Hound to win. And anybody that says differently is lying. They, nobody wanted the Mountain to win. He's always been an asshole. It's literally why they came from Dorne to kill him, because he's always been an asshole. No, I, I disagree with you on that, because I, I think it was almost poetic the way that he, he went out, because his... Uh, you know, like, a, 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 like it was absolutely he, poetic. Yeah. I'm not saying it wasn't. And, That's not my point. I'm just saying, you know, especially him diving headfirst into fire, knowing that that's his biggest fear in life. Yeah, it's absolutely poetic. But I still wanted a winner. Yeah, but he's terrified of his brother and fire, and he 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 throws himself and his brother into the fire. I mean, that's I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I think that like the fight lived up to the hype. You know, the mountain is is invulnerable. He's just he can't be dis defeated, and um, I think they made the mountain look like a, just more of a monster than we knew he was. Um, but then it was hilarious watching um, the Hound just laugh <laughs> throughout the entire thing. Like, it's just incredulous that like, what's it going to take to kill him? I love that visually it was amazing. Having it on the staircase was cool. I never would have expected it to be there. Um, there was this one shot of like Drogon flying over, which is just amazing. I think kind of cutting that with what was going on with Ari, I thought was great. So I really, I really love the, the game bowl. And I, yeah, like, I think that's the perfect ending. He knew he was going to die. Like he, he had no reservation. There was no part of him that thought, you know, I'm coming out of this. So I think it makes it made sense that that was his last act, and he knew it. Like I mean, at least at least he knew going down. Like I've killed him. I've done it. You know, I've 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 uh, you know, his last act in life was to to defeat two of, of, of the two enemies in his life. So I think it was it was very poetic, and I think it was a perfect kind of perfect send off. Did anyone else get like that Austin Powers moment where he's like, "Why won't you die?" <laughs> yeah, that's really all I was thinking. I will say, what do you guys think of the look? Because I didn't love. He looked like a baby almost. Yeah, they should have left the the hair that he had when he died and the beard and all that. I'm right with you, Ryan. I love the look of the fight. I thought it was extremely violent. I was scared that the Hound was going to get Prince Oberimed when he stuck his fingers in his eye socket. I was like, "Oh no, here we go again." He's just going to crush the Hound's head. But I did kind of like the ending. I thought it was you know very very fitting for the both of them to kind of fall from that height into the fire any other way killing the mountain at this point wouldn't seem believable to me i mean he stuck him through the eye and through the brain and that guy he kept going so i i just think that that was probably the best way and i also wonder if we're going to walk back any of these deaths that we had this weekend that we didn't actually see them die jamie finds Circe as the kingdom's collapsing around them and leads her to the basement of the Red Keep, where I find myself saying, I can't get her out to, via the transport, so I'm going to have to tr take her to the Falcon. As it all falls down around them, as the city that Cersei so wanted to rule over collapses, Jamie tells her, look at me. Nothing else matters, only us. Now, Kim, I know you are right along with the fan base are pretty torn up about this death because he wanted nothing more than to see the queen suffer a more grisly fate. Could you find even a little bit of beauty in this tragic goodbye? I did, and shame on them for making me almost sympathize with these characters. You know, like, that really... Damn it! What what are y'all doing to me here? I, I don't like them. Stop 
trying to make me feel like I should have empathy for these people. But I do think it was very appropriate for her to be basically crushed by her own kingdom, by the one thing that she, other than her children, that she obviously couldn't protect and save. The one thing that she held so near and dear was that red keep, that symbol of her kingdom. You know, that was the only thing that she had left for pride to have pride in and for it to literally fall upon her like just she watched everything crumble around her and then on her and I thought you know when I watched it the second time I thought all right I, I get it now the first time I watched it I was thinking that's just terrible it was over too quick you know boom 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 and then they're both just gone but then when you go back and you watch it a second time you go I get it now I understand the angle that they were trying to get at with this and I didn't pick up on it the first time and shame on me for not you know paying closer attention to the little finite details or whatever but it, it was well done I think it was very poetic the way that her send-off was not necessarily for Jamie but you know if you really think of the symbolism in it it was it was well done well they do say heavy lies the crown I think that the red keep probably lies a little bit heavier than that her crying and saying I don't want her baby to die i'm like hey lady that ship is burning in the uh the black water bay over there it's a little late for that maybe you shouldn't have cut that poor lady's head off last week if you were actually worried about your kid dying but i did feel for them it did touch me a little bit it reminded me of the titanic and the old couple in the boat just holding each other just saying goodbye because there was literally no way out as characters ig how are you going to remember cersei and jamie uh well cersei i'm gonna remember her as a woman who absolutely loved her children and would kill everyone for looking at them cross and would kill everyone for thinking about looking at them cross and would kill everyone who might think that they might look at them cross, which basically says she's going to kill everybody. So she's really kind of a heartless bitch unless you're related to her, because while she had that moment of thing with Jamie, I think she would have killed him if he looked at the kids cross and that's unfortunate because Jamie did truly love her. And that's what I've got for Jamie. Is he somebody who loved his family way more than anybody really should? But that's another conversation. He was really all in it for his family. And he said it when he was brought in at Winterfell is that I did it for my family and I'd do it again. And here he goes out going to be with his family, with his sister, who he loves and now has given up his life for. It, it really is just that simple. We can talk about complexities and everything else. It's just people that love their family. That's all they are. Are they heartless to everyone else? Absolutely. But which one of us wouldn't go to the ends of the earth for someone that we truly love. You look at Christmas time as no other reflection of people and their behavior. It's supposed to be a, a time of giving and love and, and spirit and family. And then you'll see people beat each other bloody on Black Friday for $85 off a TV. The people, the same people are like, oh, they're too ruthless. They're too evil. You're doing the same thing. Maybe not on a, as much of a scale, but your behavior is still just reprehensible. Arya left on a mission of revenge, and it became a fight for survival as she was burned, trampled, and literally had the whole city dropped on her. Ryan, your thoughts on her journey, the white horse, the episode, and your rating? I was mixed on that scene, because I feel like so much of the show has been her, you know, on this kind of march to kill Cersei. And, um, you know, I think that that scene with the Hound was was touching and one of the, you know, more kind of emotional scenes of the show. But to have her not complete that was strange, but... You know, I did love what they did with her throughout the rest of the episode. It kind of similar to Battle of the Bastards, and in, in it just kind of you, you're following somebody in the middle of, of a battle, disoriented. It really put you in the middle of, of it, um, and it was really, really well done. Um, and I saw some of the behind the episode where they actually kind of recreated Dubrovnik. All of that was created in a set because because I, I was in Dubrovnik last year, and I was like, oh, I saw that place. I was at that place. All these places I recognized. And they're like, nope, they just completely recreated like 20 blocks of of, of Dubrovnik just for this uh, 
for the show, which is amazing. But it, it really added to it that that single shot. I think that you know at least a couple minutes where it was just a single shot following her was amazing. And you know seeing her kind of try to save people but just completely fail. And you know the white horse obviously has some meaning. It was a cool way to end the show. And you know I I have no idea how they're gonna. T- tie all this up in one episode. You know, I, I've kind of said this, I said to you guys offline um, that in a vacuum, this show is a 9.5 for me. I think it was phenomenally, you know, just, it was shot amazing. Um, it had all the tension that you want out of like, you know, the kind of pen and ultimate episode. Um, it was brutal. Whether you liked it or not, um, Daenerys's turn, you know, sh- her performance was so great that you you buy every minute of it. Um, the stuff with Varys was really good. Um, the stuff with Jamie. And, and Tyrion was really well done and yeah on, on its own as a standalone episode uh, I mean effects everything about this episode was the stuff with Drogon was amazing so uh, we, we got the Clegane Bowl you know and it, again it did that thing that it does with many of the battle episodes where it doesn't just it's you're not doing an hour hour and 20 minutes of just one battle but you're seeing different perspectives you know you're, you know at one point you're following Danny, you know destroying all the scorpions then you're watching her destroy King's Landing you're watching the horror of the 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 small folk um you're watching you know aria you know the, the clegane bowl and the stuff with james so just they really do the different perspectives really well so yeah on its own it's a 9.5 there are a lot of other things um surrounding the episode um you know that i'm not sure of i don't love that you know jamie's arc you know slid back to him you know just going for cersei i did and yeah, maybe I drop it down a little bit because I, I think the Euron scene was just dumb. <laughs> and and just him washing up on shore, just happening to find Jamie after being blown off of a, a boat. It's just, uh, they could have done a better job with that. And yeah, there are a lot of kind of things around it, how how things are going to be resolved, um, kind of the way that they handled Daenerys' descent, I didn't love. But but as an episode, as a as, as its own thing, I, I mean, it was just phenomenal. So I give it a 9.5. I think for me, I'm going to have to go with a nine. There was just a couple of little things that I I really couldn't let go. Like Ryan was just saying that that scene with Euron and Jamie and Jamie's ending character tie up with the arc. I, I don't know. it, But altogether, it was there was a lot of callbacks to previous episodes and there was a lot of foreshadowing and Bran having had that vision back in, I think it was season four, you know, with the, the Mad King, well, we thought it was the Mad King at least, but King's Landing, uh, having that shadow of the dragon flying over it, which I think is a clever little Easter egg that has been hidden because now it's, we know that he can actually see into the future. And it's not just the past that he's seeing. And so maybe that's what he was doing, you know, during the battle at Winterfell or something. Who who the hell knows? I'm still curious about where those ravens went, you know, that he uh, occupied. But for me, it's a nine. I have my theories in my head about who's what's going to happen in this last episode. And I think I sent them to you earlier this morning. So let's let's see how that plays out. I don't want to jinx it. So I'm wondering really what they're going to do for a final episode, because what, there's three people left alive in Westeros. So there's, everybody's dead. So I think it's a lot of good things happen in this episode. It would, first of all, probably the most beautifully shot episode in Game of Thrones of all time. It is... There's so many epic things to see in it, like the like Ryan said earlier, that shot of Drogon flying over the Clegane Bowl was beautiful, and so many things that they did with that, the CGI was spot on. Everything that they did just looked epic, and this was truly an epic episode. And as far as the the impact on the show, right up there with Battle of the Bastards and Hard Home and everything else, this is a beautiful thing to look at. There was a little couple of few problems, like how are we going to end this in one episode? Because they killed so many people, and it's a problem. But I have faith because I've loved Game of Thrones since the very first season. I think they're going to come out with something really good. And I think we're all going to have what they told us was going to be a bittersweet ending. And I think that maybe we're all going to yearn for more. And we're not going to get it. And that's okay. Because we all wanted more Sopranos. We didn't get that. We all wanted more Breaking Bad. We didn't get that. Every good thing has to come to an end. And I would rather it end the way it's going to end than to drag it on until we're all going to be dead from watching it. I think the the last scene with Arya riding off on that white horse 
is going to mean more than anybody's willing to give her credit for. I think she's going to be somehow connected to the Iron Throne at the end of this. That's my thought. I think that that is the scene that gives it away. Um, and she may not be there alone. Maybe she takes Gendry up. I don't know. But I think that there's more to be seen. Next week, next week is going to be heartbreaking and wonderful all at the same time. This episode, though, just purely carnage everywhere you go, but beautifully shot. A lot of emotion and a lot of really good acting in it. And I think, honestly, Daenerys is acting in this. Uh, it, Amelia Clark was amazing. She did, I don't think she said a word after the, the opening scenes and after she spoke to John. I don't think another word was spoken from her. But the way she was emoting through her face and her action, was it was beautifully done. I can't say enough about the acting of the people on this show. I'm hoping that they're actually this good actors and it's just not the double D's and the production staff and the directors of these shows. I th I'm hoping that we get to see more of them in the future. <clears throat> I give the episode, I give it a nine. Uh, I'm not quite at 10 level. I'm not quite at 9.5 level. It's still a nine episode, though. It's really, really good. Yeah, Arya's journey was epic for me. I mean, it had me on the edge of my seat the whole time. I was worried. I was scared. I was rooting for her. And they did a great job making us think that maybe she won't make it. And that would have been devastating to me, although I wouldn't take to the Internet and cry about it because I'm an adult and I'm used to disappointment. Unlike episode three, we had some really major character deaths and we could actually see them. Visually, this episode was stunning. The fire, the collapse of the Capitol, the dragon fire going off and the uh, wildfire going off in the background was great. The use of the overhead shots was amazing. It looked every bit as good as a big budget film. They've done a great job with that this season where it, that it's not TV, it's HBO it just rings true in so many ways. I know people are unhappy with the season. It's had its problems. But sometimes I think people have forgotten that we're watching a story that was never meant to have a happy ending or make you feel good. This is a show that killed off its main protagonist in episode 10 just to show you it wasn't fucking around. It's given us the Red Wedding, and the villains have always been more epic and interesting and complex than the heroes. Ramsey Bolton once said, if you think this is going to have a happy ending, then you haven't been paying attention. And he was right. I give Bells a nine. It captured the end of the world and the death of Daenerys Stormborn and the birth of the Mad Queen, all in tragic beauty. Fire and blood, my friends. Fire and blood, indeed. And that's it for this episode of the Cynic Radio Podcast. I'm Igor He. We had a great time bringing you this week's show. Please send all your comments, questions, concerns, and any crazy news stories from your neck of the woods to cynicradio at gmail.com. Find us on the internet at cynicradio.com. Look for us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Cynic Radio and find us on Twitter at Cynic Radio. Continue to like, listen, subscribe, and share this with all your friends and family. And until next time, don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at CynicRadio.com. Available for download on iTunes. 